All right, so now we're going to be having heard about how to um, embed or best practices around about uh, creating questions. We're going to show four projects that have used H5P in their courses. So first, we're going to start off with uh, Kaylee, who's going to talk through how she has used um, H5P within her online textbook. Uh, then we're going to be talking about how I've used it within my psychology course before going to uh, Brenna Clark Gray, who's Educational Technologies at Thompson uh, Rivers University, and how Brenna has used it within her course. And then Stephen Barnes, who is an Associate Professor of Teaching at UBC, and how he's used H5P in a very inventive way. So to get us started, uh, Project Showcase, we're going to be talking first and then Brenna and then. So the problem, just to give a little bit of a scope, each of these we're going to talk about why did we start using H5P and then give some definitions as to, sorry, some examples as to how we did it. So the problem for Kaylee and I is that we know that university is expensive. Uh, over the last 30 years, we see that prices have increased over 400% for universities. And we can look often, um, domestic students tend to pay less than international students uh, substantially less. So for international students, this burden is often significantly higher. And we know within the, the, the US there's a student debt crisis of 1.52 trillion. And we know from other resources that uh, minoritized students tend to be hit harder with student um, debt. And quite often it's not only the cost of university, but it's the hidden cost that comes along with buying textbooks. And so the open education movement has really posed a nice challenge to textbooks in um, uh, offering free open online resources, but textbooks have kind of hit back by having these homework systems uh, where that offer the e-book and then formative assessment opportunities and test banks and whatnot, um, which is a little bit more difficult for open resources to, to reply to. And so we can see that these homework systems is often what now shifts these hidden costs because one program area and one medium sized British Columbian institution for one term of just under um, 1800 students of about $78 for access to this online homework system makes about 140,000 Canadian dollars. So we see that there's still these hidden costs and uh, how are we able to lighten the burden for students. And then just as we've heard, H5P and these open sources offer the opportunity um, for best practices, right? Um, it provides flexibility in how we can embed, we can make the textbook more interactive. We know active learning has better effects than passive reading. And from what we've just looked at the keynote, I feel a little bit silly for showing the slide after listening to Professor McDaniel's talk, uh, but we know practice tests improve overall performance we know that multiple tests are better. And uh, this goes nicely with what uh, Professor McDaniel was saying is that it's not necessarily the number of questions you get right that correlates with learning, but it's actually the number of questions that you attempt that correlates with learning. And getting questions long leads to better learning as we've seen Professor McDaniel saying this meta memory, um, especially if this tends to be followed by feedback. And we see frequent formative assessment leads to lower anxiety and also greater motivation. So over here, H5P offers this beautiful opportunity to interface the problem of student burden, burden with the opportunity for providing interactive formative assessment opportunities. Now, I'm gonna hand it over to, to, to Kaylee, who um, for me is one of the first people to develop an interactive textbook, a fully interactive textbook. So I'd like to invite you to talk about your uh, chemistry course, please. Absolutely. So my I teach first year chemistry at UBC as, as one of the courses that I teach. And our department approached a colleague, uh, Professor Glenn Samus and I in 2014, and asked us to write a custom textbook for the course that we were teaching. The reason that we were asked to do this was partially that it was getting really expensive for students because they would have to purchase two different textbooks that were amalgamated together to cover the material in the course. And then there was also a lot of superfluous material in the course that they were having to buy the textbook for, but it wasn't covered. So they wanted this custom book that would relate to our course specifically. 
As organic chemists, our students often need to be doing uh, lots of 3D visualization to understand how molecules interact. So we thought, we uh, proposed to the department that we would make an online textbook that would let us integrate different interactive um, components that would allow us to help students understand and develop this 3D visualization. When we were talking through different possibilities, we wanted also to make interactive videos that would be able to branch depending on a how a student was doing to be able to adapt to where the student was at. One of our uh, colleagues at CTLT, Richard Tape, suggested looking into H5P at the time. And so we found that H5P actually offered all of these different opportunities for being able to create interactive formative assessment opportunities within the textbook. And so we've written the textbook and integrated H5P questions um, into every page. And we offer this for free to students so they don't need to buy a textbook at all. So I've got some screenshots for you to show you what this looks like in our textbook. Simon's going to show you some of these H5P elements actually in situ in his textbook, but I'm going to save a little bit of time to tell you about how students um, find these questions and whether they're useful. So here is an example of what a, a page looks like in our textbook. At the top, there's a key point section that summarizes uh, what they will see. In the content section, you can see here that there's some text, but right in mixed with the text, right here is an H5P question. So immediately after learning something, students are asked to try it out so that they can assess whether they understood what they just learned. Again, going on that meta memory that Professor McDaniel spoke about. So once they click, this is has a hotspot style H5P question. When they click to identify, they will immediately get feedback underneath about how they did. Then at the bottom of each page, there is a practice section with a whole bunch of different questions. Um, there such as interactive videos, fill in the blanks, hot spots, multiple choice, et cetera. So another couple of examples of types of content from H5P that we've used in the course are things like the essay question. So here, for example, they're asked, why do you think elementary reactions um, with three or more reactants are rare? And they could give an answer. And H5P is able to look for keywords within here and suggest any parts of the answer that they might have forgotten about. So for example, um, not, every not every collision goes to a successful reaction, what else might be required? And they're able to either show a full solution or to retry themselves to add in another component to their answer. And I've had students describe these as magic when they're made well, that they ask me, how the heck did the computer know what I was talking about um, and able to mark an essay question um, on its own. Here's another example of a question. So this is using a drag and drop H5P. So students are able to take these different chemistry uh, molecules, which are inserted as images, and they can drag them into any three of these parts. This is a chemical mechanism that students really struggle with and find really complex. So it's a way that before they are, uh, I, I don't think, I think I looked at the registration. I don't think there's many chemists here. So um, this is a way for them to be trying this out before they're having to get to the point of writing it out by themselves on uh, by hand. So they drag each of the components and click check at the bottom and they'll get a little plus one or minus one to show them what they got right and wrong. And they're able to retry it again. And then there's also uh, more standard questions. So this is using a question set or quiz content type from H5P. You can see the little dots down here showing there's four different questions. And this is more of a standard multiple choice question. So we have lots of those incorporated as well. That's one of our most used question types. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, are these questions useful? Because H5P doesn't um, easily offer a lot of analytics, though I do have it integrated. Um, we have our own instance of H5P, so we have a little bit more analytics than, um, than normal. So I wanted to show you a little bit about do students like these things. Um, we asked 1,100 students taking first year chemistry to take this online textbook and rate how helpful they found each component of the book. So over here on the right is 100, meaning that they found it very helpful. Zero was very unhelpful and 50 was neutral. So you can see first that they're finding the book helpful in general. But these things that I've highlighted in pink are the things that can be made use, using H5P. The interactive challenge questions we made with H5P. Um, the standard interactive questions, as well as interactive videos. And you can see these are the things that are coming out on top as the most helpful components of the online book. So they're really valuing these. So in addition to valuing them, we want to know, well, are they using them? 
So we have um, some analytics uh, using XAPI statements for our instance of H5P that is able to show us how student, how often students are using these features and interacting with them. So there's around uh, 1600 students registered in this course. And you can see in blue on the left here is number of students. So we have over a thousand students on at, at a high by accessing the chirp per day. And that we can see also that there are up to 90,000 interactions with the book per student, or sorry, 90 interaction, 90,000 interactions with the book overall in a single day. You can probably guess when our midterm and our final exam were in this course. Um, so students are particularly finding these H5P questions helpful to help them prepare for exams, but there's also a baseline of around 10,000 interactions per day from students in the course. So on this now, I'd like to talk a little bit about how I've used H5P in my course, and I'll show you some of the, the examples of, of where it is embedded in my question, uh, in my, my textbook. So this was in, done in collaboration with BC Campus. Um, I received a grant uh, with, with Kaylee and, and Dr. Stephen Barnes, and we said we'd make 150 formative assessment opportunities um, into the OpenStax psychology textbook. And so, we actually ended up doing over 500 elements with over 1000 questions. So in this project, we aim to provide regular opportunity for students to practice what they have learned. So over here, if anyone is interested in looking at the textbook, you're welcome to uh, see the project over here. So providing regular feedback. Over here, students would read on operant conditioning, they'd read all the text in operant conditioning. And then over here, they'd get a number of questions, test your understanding on it. And then they would go into primary and secondary reinforcers. They'd read the next section. And at the end of the next session, section, there'd be another set of questions. And the questions wherever possible were created on um, you know, bird watching and actual processes that you can find in real life. Then you read the next little bit, and once again, at the end, you get some more questions. So we wanted to provide regular opportunities for students to practice what they've just learned. We wanted to provide feedback on incorrect options so students could improve their understanding. So for instance, students would go to this little course over here, which been looking at correlations. Now that you've just learned about correlations, let's test your understanding. How would you describe the most likely correlation between weight and height? Well, as weight goes up, height goes up. Cool, correct, I got that correct. What direction do you think the correlation between hours of sleep and tiredness is? Now, let's say that someone says the more you sleep, the more tired you are. So that's a positive correlation and they get it wrong. This would then branch to something saying, oh, you got it wrong. Here's a little bit of an explanation as to why it's wrong. Here are some other examples of correlations. And now let's try this again. And then you try and it would be a negative correlation and you'd go correct. So wherever possible, we would provide feedback um, to increase their understanding. We also wanted to give students a sense of control and mastery uh, and making learning a little bit more entertaining. So we created a whole bunch of branching interactive videos where students were often seen as the, um, uh, the expert. So over here, we have a guy called Preston that we created and Preston is a 16 year old intern who's a bit of a, uh, not the smartest tool in the tool shed. And uh, he's put in all these types of situations where he comes up with problems he asks the question, and then you as the watcher who is put in the person of a position of power have to answer his question. So I'll play a quick little um, example of Preston in a sleep lab. Ah, uh, hey doc, your EEG um, e -E machine thingy is beeping. What does this mean? So having just read it, it paused to ask for a question. Students would hopefully know that this is, um, a, a, what is it? Not a K-complex, but it's a sleep spindle, which you found in stage two. Let's say they get this wrong and they go stage one. It's an explanation. When we're awake and alert, our brains exhibit beta waves. In stage one of sleep, we would expect to see alpha waves, which are lower in frequency and higher in amplitude than beta waves.
As the patient continued in stage one, we would also expect to see theta waves, which are even lower in frequency and somewhat higher in amplitude. In the EEG that Preston showed, the patient does seem to exhibit theta waves, but there is also a burst of high-frequency, high-amplitude activity that is not consistent with stage 1 sleep. Which stage of sleep involves theta waves, as well as brief bursts of electrical activity? So over here, you can see that then it pauses and asks for a question. The question again, after the explanation, a student can replay the explanation, or they can try. They get it correct. And they move on it. Okay. And they get to the next question. Over here, it can also be used to demonstrate course content. One thing that I try to find difficult to explain over um, the internet is over here, you can see from point one to point two, the yellow dot gets brighter. Now, over here, the, the yellow dot increases in brightness by the same amount, but because the context is different, you don't witness it. And this is known as the just noticeable difference and is something that's quite difficult to explain. And it also tries to practice recall wherever possible. So over here, not only do we have these question sets test your understanding at the end of a section, but over here, we can also use something like the glossary. We can help put an accordion over here. Students would have to remember what agoraphobia is, recall it, then they can click and test. So it kind of creates the glossary almost like a flashcard. And now great, this is uh, free to students and it's free to instructors and it can be embedded anywhere. So talking about these interactive videos, I'm gonna hand over to Kaylee to talk briefly about your experiences with the interactive videos. Sure, so the, the interactive video that Simon demonstrated there with Preston the intern um, is one of many interactive videos that we've worked on. And so I have done some studies into the effectiveness of these interactive videos. So interactive videos are ones where it's guiding a student through a problem step by step, pausing to ask for input and then branching based on what that input is. And it allows students to control the pace of the video. Our goal is to keep students engaged when watching videos from home, which can inherently be quite a passive activity and to ensure students are understanding one step before they're proceeding on to the next step of a solution or a concept. So our goal was to create videos to support learning in our context, chemistry and psychology, to ensure students are actively engaged rather than passive consumers. We And then we wanted to investigate too, are these videos more effective than traditional videos? So we had students randomly assigned to watch either an interactive video or the identical video that was non except it was non-interactive. So it was as a worked example. And we asked them then about their experience watching the video. So in green here, you can see our students who watch the interactive version and in blue is non-interactive. Anywhere where you see a start at the top, we saw statistically significant differences for students who watched interactive versus non-interactive. And keep in mind, they have no idea that a different version of the video exists. So what they found, what we found was that students who watched the interactive video felt significantly more able to answer questions. They found it more enjoyable. They found that they had better control over the pace. They thought the pace of the video was more appropriate. They better felt that they were able to master concepts before moving on. And they thought it was a more effective method. In a fur further study, we replicated these results actually in several further studies. We also added an additional question about um, engagement and students watching the interactive version of the video reported feeling much more engaged. We then revealed to students that there were two different versions of the video available and we asked them what would you prefer over on the far right is a strong preference for the interactive version over on the strong left on the left is a strong preference for the, uh, the traditional video. And you can see that regardless whether students watch the non-interactive or interactive video to begin with, so either green or blue, they had a strong preference for this interactive video, thinking that it would be more enjoyable, their preference, more engaging, um, and a more effective way to learn. So what we found overall is that all the videos were effective at promoting learning, but students had a strong preference for interactive videos. And we are currently working to further study, to parse out those long-term academic effects of watching an interactive video versus non-interactive video versus text. But I think we don't have time for that. We don't have time um, to that. Yeah, so We've we been doing that. a study with the sleep video that I showed you, but I'm happy to talk to anyone um, offline. I would actually like to give uh, Brenna Clark Gray some opportunity, just a couple of thanks to the people that have helped in both of our courses, in both of our 
um, projects. Projects. Mm -hmm. uh, Brenna, are you here? We would love to hear about mm -hmm. how you've been using H5P in your course. Mm -hmm. Sure am. Hi, everybody. Let me just get my screen going here. Okay, thanks so much for having me. I'm always excited to talk about H5P. I'm always excited to chat with Simon. So this is a this is a good fit. I hope everybody's having a good time at the symposium. Um, I'm gonna link a chat, uh, I'm gonna put a link in the chat here. So this is a resource that I built for uh, a talk on this project at OE Global that was a bit longer. So it goes uh, a little bit more into detail um, if you're curious about any of these. But the nice thing is that this site also has a little package where you can download all these objects. So um, if you wanna use them as a starting place for your own work, they're there and ready uh, to, to grab. Um, so uh, my name is Brenna Clark Gray. I'm coordinator of educational technologies at Thompson Rivers University, joining you from beautiful Shwetmakulu this morning. The sun is shining, it's glorious here. It's also extremely cold, but I'm inside, so I just see the sunshine. Um, I am talking to you today about a project I built for um, a BC campus grant, actually the same grant that Simon was talking about previously, I think. Um, and what we did was we wanted to really look at how we could make use of H5P in developing a composition course textbook or in, in improving a composition course textbook. Um, there are tons of examples out there about using H5P for like closed ended questions or like sort of facts, but how you make use of H5P in a more open ended kind of context can be a bit, uh, a bit more complicated or, or tricky to think through. So my background before I became coordinator of educational technologies here is that I was a composition instructor, well, English instructor, but half of my load was composition um, at Douglas College in New West for nine years. And so I've always been really interested in how we can provide more formative feedback to students um, in a course that is extremely demanding on the instructor. So there is a lot of feedback in a first year writing course and finding ways to offer additional feedback opportunities for students um, that don't necessarily re result in more instructor workload is something I'm really curious about. Um, so for this project, we developed 168 activities for the Writing for Success first year textbook. Um, it is still going through its peer review process at BC campus, so I can't link you to the book itself. Uh, but if you take a look at this link that I've dropped in the chat, you'll be able to see all these exercises that I'm going to talk about today anyway there. And if you're curious about any others, I'm more than happy to send along more examples. You can reach out to me by email. I'll pop that in the chat in a second too. Um, a real key for us was involving students in the development of these resources. So one nice thing about having access to undergraduate research uh, students, research assistants, is that they've all been put through first year composition. Every student takes first year composition and they may be coming at it from a range of perspectives. So one thing we did, we had uh, the BC campus grant enabled us to hire two student research assistants. And their first job was to sit down and read the textbook and flag the places where they thought interactivity uh, interactive activities would be more useful. Um, and then we set them about developing those activities. So it was really um, kind of ground up from the student experience of reading the book and where they saw utility in adding additional interactives. Um, anyway, all this to say, I'm gonna focus on three activity types today really briefly. And as I say, please do go check out the website for more information about all of them. Uh, in sort of, uh, in order of more open-endedness. So something that we spend a lot of time on in composition classes often is paragraphing structure and different choices around paragraphing structure, organizing ideas chronologically or by order of importance, for example. So I find that the summary tool in uh, H5P works really well for helping students to think through the order of um, ideas. So in this case, they're being asked to put the statements in chronological order. Um, and so there's lots of signaling language here, right? So I'm going to start with every morning I make my coffee the same way for maximum flavor. There's my topic sentence, right? Uh, first, I do this. Next, I do this. Finally, I do this. Um, and then, you know, so it gives students feedback right away if they're understanding the concept of chronology. Likewise, we do the same thing with order of importance. But that's still pretty closed ended compared to what we want them to be able to do in an English class by the end, right? 
I also make a lot of use of the essay tool. The essay tool is a little bit funny because it's not for writing essays at all. It's really for writing summaries. I mean, ideally, the summary tool I use for writing paragraphs and the essay tool I use for writing summaries. Um, most composition classes include an assignment around a summary or a precy writing. Um, and what's nice about the essay is that you can flag the kind of key terms or key ideas that you want to raise um, and you can make it so that students have to address them. So if we check this, uh, we'll, oh, I didn't, that's because I didn't put anything in the box. Here we go, this is a good example. So they've been asked to paraphrase this, right? Using the summary tool. And what I can do is I can tag key ideas that I want them to um, touch on in their summary and give them a little bit of a key or an idea as to why. And then I can also give them a sample solution. One thing that I spend a lot of time doing in developing these activities is thinking about ways to communicate that there's not just simply one right answer, that this is an example, right? And so you'll see that the feedback sort of over and over again articulates, this is just one way to address it. Um, and I just saw a question in the chat, are you able to save student work? So these are for practice. They're not gonna save or um, submit these for assessment, but with the documentation tool, which I use a lot, you can save that student work. Students are responsible for saving their own work, um, but yes, you can. So the documentation tool was actually the first one that I came to for um, academic writing classes. And it's because I wanted to make virtual uh, a, an activity that I do in every single class, which is the thesis development exercise, where we start with the question that the students are responding to, and we work through a series of steps together in class, and we come to a thesis statement. Um, and I wanted to try to formalize that as something that I could share with other instructors who might need use of it, but also something that I could share with students learning at a distance, right, or um, particularly in a pandemic context. And so the documentation tool, good question if it's the only one. I, Andrew, I'm not actually 100% sure. It's the only one of the three I'm showing you where we can export the work at the end, but I, I don't want to say that definitively. Um, so you can see that students are asked to work through. They're also, with this exercise, uh, working through the kinds of steps you need to do to come up with a good thesis, making sure you're answering the question, making sure you're hitting all the key points, those kinds of things. Um, but they're also asked to review the thesis statement rules, right? So what do I need to know for my thesis statement? What does it have to do? And what we can do with the documentation tool is set it up as these criteria against which they will then reflect on their own thesis statement. So in the exercise below, they're asked to um, make three points about, did you address all the components? Did you make an assertion or a claim? And are there multiple perspectives on your topic? So they're asked to address those three things using the criteria tool. And then uh, after they draft the thesis, they're actually brought back to those original criteria that they set up and asked to reflect on whether or not they've achieved their goal in that regard. So it's nice because you can build in some formative self-check, some formative self-reflection that's really concrete. One of the things I love about using documentation tool for this kind of free writing or pre-writing work is that I really do think we communicate the importance of what we're teaching students by giving it real estate. So, you know, I, everybody has probably had the experience of the difference in sort of seriousness between having a prepared handout for students and asking them to just pull out a piece of paper, right? We signal importance or formality in all kinds of nonverbal ways. And I think that, um, Pre-writing and free writing exercises are often things that students skip right on through when they're working through a textbook. These tools allow us to give space, concrete, ex like explicit space saying, this is important. I'm giving some textbook real estate to it and I want you to, to take the time to do it. Um, obviously I didn't do the exercise for you, but you do get an, a document export option at the end. It just saves it as a text file. And then you could have students submit that to you or you could use it for group work. Um, in the critique pre-writing exercise that I've built, they actually share that document um, back and forth in order to give each other some feedback on the tool. Um, and I have actually been increasingly playing with the idea of using this for the assignment preparation itself so that the document that they come out with at the end is the finished document. Now there's all kinds of formatting limitations obviously to a text file but I do think that it has quite a lot of um, promise for short types of assignments. Again where we're trying to sort of streamline the process for students and give them like a clear 
a clear space in which to do the work within their textbook. That's one of the real strengths, I think, about H5P is not asking students to go elsewhere to do the exercise, but having it embedded right there while they're learning the content is, I think, very, very helpful. Okay, I see that I am just about at the end of my time. So I just wanna give you one, uh, my little bonus exercise, which is I've been using the multiple choice tool set to have multiple answers, which you can do, you can have multiple right answers. Um, I set it up so that all the answers are right. And then I use it as a checklist for students to do um, before they submit their work. So lots of instructors do like a final assignment checklist. This allows you to build that right into um, your textbook resource in H5P. Anyway, that's the end of my time. I'll pop my email in the chat. Please don't hesitate to check out that resource and you can download all those uh, activities as a starting point if you wanna try them out in your own classes. Thanks. Thank you very much, Brenna. Um, a real pleasure to have you and thank you for making time. Uh, we invited Brenna to be on our panel, but Brenna's giving a keynote tomorrow. So we're <laughs> in high demand. So thank you very much for making the time to come talk to us. Um, it very rarely happens that there's two things. <laughs> <laughs> Really impressed, especially with your, with your essay work. It's phenomenal. So thank you very much for sharing with us today. Thanks, Simon. Um, so now I'd like to invite Stephen Barnes, an uh, um, associate professor of uh, teaching here at UBC. Stephen's sort of taken the open source part of H5P and adapted it to create a non-linear remixable way um, of presenting work to students. So uh, Stephen's going to do a lot better job of explaining. The, so Stephen, uh, the spotlight is over to you. Thanks, Simon. Um, just as a preface here, uh, actually I'm gonna share a link to the project in the chat menu uh, that you can, it's actually not a link, but you can, you can follow it. Um, so this tool, although I'm using it right now for a presentation, wasn't built for a presentation. Um, so I'm using it so I can show you the tool at the same time I give the presentation. That's the only reason. And I'll explain why it was built uh, momentarily. Um, so uh, this is uh, the tapestry tool. Um, this is actually what we call a tapestry. And tapestry uses H5P. So every node in this tapestry that I'm going to show you is actually, in this case, an H5P widget. Now, it doesn't have to be an H5P widget. It could be a video. It could be an image. It could be a website. Uh, all of that can be embedded. Um, and we've used this. Uh, people have used this now in a wide variety of contexts. It doesn't have to be just at UBC or just in a post-education, uh, post-secondary educational context. A lot of uh, we've gotten a lot of uptake with this tool uh, in healthcare settings, actually, uh, specifically professional development, and also uh, dealing with patient groups as well. And this is in part because uh, there's so much interest right now in something called learning health systems, which depends on feedback from patients, from caregivers, and from uh, doctors uh, to, to inform how health research progresses. Um, and that is what is important in the tapestry tool. That is the, the notion that people can contribute to content and they can reuse content as well. So just like any H5P widget, a person can reuse content. Uh, I'm sure you've seen this little button at the bottom right-hand corner. And if you can see it right now, it's pretty small. Uh, basically, that allows you to download the widget and reuse it, uh, if you're not familiar. Um, so this tool uh, was actually developed uh, with the help of many, many students as faculty members and staff. Um, so we currently are in an alpha version that probably is calling it a bit less than it is. Uh, we're, and I'll explain where we're going with it um, in a bit. So we, we had over 1,000 students user test this, um, about 500 students in lab and about 500 students in class. Now in lab uh, actually means in many cases Zoom since we've been doing the research during the pandemic. Um, so at UBC, this tool has been used uh, for a variety of contexts. Um, it's been used as a collaborative mind mapping tool by people. Uh, it's been used for remote field trips using the um, H5P video 360 video widget. Um, and also for individual student projects and group projects. Uh, because it's a collaborative tool that allows multiple users to contribute to what we call a tapestry, a network of nodes, um, this means that uh, people can co-design content. Uh, and specifically what we're interested in or what we were hoping to encourage is in student instructor co-design of content. So basically an instructor could set up a framework uh, a basic tapestry and then allow students to add nodes. And these nodes could be um, 
uh, uh, formative assessments or summative assessments, sorry, summative assessments that a student creates. There could be videos that a student creates. It could be anything that they could desire other than VR at this point. Um, and th that would grow the tapestry. So the notion here is that the students would reuse that tap, the, the instructor would reuse that tapestry, carry that student content into the next offering of, of the course, obviously with student permission. Um, and outside of UBC, it's being used quite heavily. Uh, so right now it's being used by the TIDE project, which is a, a, an educational program designed to help youth with autism spectrum disorder transition from high school into post-secondary education and or the workplace. And this shows you just how customizable the interface can be. So this is actually the tapestry tool, and this is a pop-up widget from the tapestry tool. Um, oh, yeah. And then in terms of professional development, where we're getting a lot of uptake right now, uh, it's gonna be used by ACE, ACEBC, which is the Academic Communication Equity uh, Association of British Columbia, to educate post-secondary ed employees about how to best manage accommodations for disabled students. Now, part of that process is going to be us um, in, doing some major improvements on the tool in terms of accessibility to support this. That is, we don't wanna have a tool that is inaccessible in any way to students who might be um, might have a disability. And so we're, we're working on tweaking it uh, to make it as accessible as possible. And I'll talk about that a bit. That's sort of an excellent, oh, I failed to show you a slide. Okay, so the other PD uh, effort that's been done is uh, being used by the BC Support Unit, which is funded by the Michael Smith Foundation uh, to educate researchers about patient-engaged research. This is another example. Uh, so this shows you, um, basically the tapestry tool um, being used for that, for that exact purpose. And what you can see here um, is something that is important in the, uh, in, in the tapestry tool. That is this user has submitted a node. And in fact, they submitted two nodes. So this is a node that no one can see except for the, the, the actual creator of the node. And what it, what it is, is it's submitted to the, to the administrator, and then the administrator can peruse that node and decide whether it's appropriate or not. That is, they can approve it, that is, in which case it'll show up in green, um, or they can reject it, in which case it shows up in red. And what, another feature here that you'll see is the ability to lock questions. Uh, so you can basically create a tapestry in such a way that certain nodes are, not, are locked until either a certain time or based on their completion of previous nodes or previous assessments. Uh, so in this case, this is a locked question. And then there's an interactive video and a virtual tour that is also locked. And if I go in and finish it, um, it, it opens up these other nodes. So then it basically is, is conditional release. Um, and this, I don't know if this is working, I didn't create this. Yeah, this is a, a 360 virtual tour. As I said, people use this for virtual field trips. Um, and this is just a standard H5P widget. Okay, so, and you can make it full screen, of course, if you want to. Um, and just a few last words. Um, actually, I'm pretty good for time. So in terms of the next stages of development, we, we have a generous donation and no strings attached donation. Every, every time someone sees a corporation attached to the development of tool, they wonder whether it's gonna stay open source or whether you're selling it. Our goal is to maintain this as open source. Um, and this is part of our um, ability to um, make this a freely available tool to anyone who wants to use it. Right now it's a WordPress plugin. Um, so the alpha version is a WordPress plugin with the beta version, which we had a generous donation uh, from the Microsoft accessibility team to, to develop. Uh, we are taking it a step further in many ways. Uh, we are partnering, partnering with ACEBC, the organization I talked to you about before, um, to improve accessibility to the point that we reach um, WCAG 2.0 AA plus guidelines. Uh, we want to also build a tool that um, is faster. Uh, so it's faster on any machine. So we one aspect of accessibility, of course, is making sure that students who have low bandwidth connections can still access the content. And so we're implementing a graph database to boost application performance. We're creating a standalone platform so that you can still use all that content, H5P widgets. Um, 
on a standalone platform, making it easier to author. So it's not locked to WordPress specifically. We'll keep on, we'll keep on updating the WordPress plugin, but we're going to go to a standalone platform. We're also going to develop a zoomable interface. And the reason for that is that we've, we've noticed that obviously when you get over about a hundred nodes and we have tapestries now that are in the thousands of nodes, um, it gets overwhelming to students under that hundred mark. It seems to be manageable by most students, at least in terms of the user testing we've done. But when you get into massive tapestries, uh, it also takes a performance hit. So we're creating a zoomable interface. Um, which we have mock-ups for now, and we're actually in the process of testing them with students. Um, and then we're also enabling synchronous collaboration. Right now, if students collaborate, they see a node that's locked and they can't edit it, uh, while another student's editing it. What we want to have is that the tool should be synchronous in the sense that you, you should be able to see the other students who are collaborating on the tool on the tapestry where their cursors are. That is exactly what they're working on. Just as you would in a tool like Miro, if you're familiar with that, or Google, Google Documents, uh, where you can see the, the um, cursor of, of other people you're collaborating with. And the other thing we wanna do is add node-based video conferencing. And what that is, is basically you could click on a node and open up a chat room, a video chat room, so that um, you could basically create a spatial layout that would, for example, replicate a real space and then have like a hybrid environment where students can move from room to room and interact with that content uh, with other people. So again, we're adding a node type that in this, in this case, this node type is video conferencing. And this is just the, the project timeline for the beta version. Uh, we're aiming to launch uh, the beta version in September, um, doing some real world testing of it, and then uh, developing an onboarding system as well. And if you want to contact us, if you wanna use the tool, we're willing to support anyone who's interested um, to the best of our ability. If you want customization, we might need to uh, recoup that expense, but um, it's, not, it's nothing, that, nothing to worry about. And so that's our contact information, uh, info at tapestrytool.com. And I shared the website link to you as well. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much uh, for that, Stephen. Um, I'd like to open up to uh, the audience for any questions that you have. I see we've been answering questions as they've been going along. Um, uh, we'll have questions for about another five or so minutes, and then we'll take another five to 10 minute break before getting going with um, getting started with H5P. Uh, so I see that there's a, uh, okay, so Novex replying to a question that I put out is currently a WordPress plugin, um, seems going stand, uh, but seems as if it's going standalone. Is that right, Stephen? Yeah, it's going standalone, uh, but we're going to maintain the uh, WordPress plugin as well. Okay, so fantastic. really both will be available. Fantastic. Do we have any other questions? Is Canvas able to integrate the um, tapestry tools, the tapestries, I mean? Uh, you, can, you can embed a tapestry in any website. So if you actually go to our homepage, you'll see that there's tapestries there. Uh, so it can be embedded in any HTML page as, a, as an iframe. Uh, so it could, in theory, be embedded in Canvas. We haven't done that, but I'm sure it could be. Perfect. Um, Brenna, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, a question that was asked earlier about the branching scenarios is that um, how time consuming is it? And so quite often I find that a, a lot of planning helps um, reduce the amount of time. Uh, I imagine these essays, because they're so foreign to me, and, and please, Kaylee, feel jump in as well if you've got something to comment on this. Um, how time consuming are these essays uh, questions to make? Yeah, so um, it's about thinking through process. So like anything, once you've taught it a zillion times, you probably know the process you work through with students like the back of your hand, right? So I don't find them that, that time consuming to develop. Um, they do tend to take iteration. So, you know, oftentimes I'll find that um, working through it with actual students, I've missed a step or I've assumed something is obvious that isn't, um, which, you know, is something we, we have to battle all the time. Um, so I don't find them particularly time consuming to develop, certainly not anything like a branching scenario, but 
similar to a branching scenario, you want to have a plan in place of where you're trying to get to. So, you know, the goal is to have a thesis statement that a student has spent time um, has spent time revising against a set of criteria. So you need to have those pieces in place. But no, I, I mean, I find branching scenarios really hard. So compared to that, they're a walk in the park. <laughs> Well, oh, I, I see that essays is very hard, so I, I'll, I'll happily do a branching scenario. Um, Kaylee, do you have any, do you have any comments? Because I know that not only have you done these essay questions, but you've also looked into um, branching interactive videos, and they can also be quite uh, time consuming. Uh, do you have any golden tips for um, planning or comments on how time intensive they are? Mm, yeah, I think the the interactive videos can certainly be um, time consuming. I've found that they if I if I include everything. So again, planning is key. If I include everything, it does take me probably up to 10 hours to make an interactive video. But that can be like a half an hour interactive video with like interactions every minute. So that's a lot of interactivity to be building in. And that's right from that 10 hours includes planning, scripting, recording a video, and adding all interactivity. So that's kind of what I find my all-in time is, but that's for a resource then that, um, you know, a couple thousand students use every year and have been using for eight years. So it's not too bad of a return on the investment, but it is definitely an initial investment. Um, in terms of the things like branching scenarios and essays and stuff, I find the first few that I make have taken me a long time, and I've gotten faster and faster because you start to figure out what types of questions it works well for and what types of questions it doesn't work well for. And you just start to get efficient knowing like when you think of the thing of, of the concept of the question, you think, ah, oh, yes, that's going to work well or no, it's not. And so you end up getting quite efficient as you do more of them. Fantastic. I see someone asked about uh, best practices regarding copyright. And so I see Will has popped in saying, um, when creating an H5P object, you can set a Creative Commons license for that object that allows other people to reuse or adapt the question that makes H5P a, a fantastic OER tool. There are several different types of copyright that you can use as well. And we have links to those on the H5P site. Um, and also when using images, do you have space to put in metadata? Does the images have any copyright um, attributions? Uh, so we're, we'll be talking through in the next session how to do all of that as well. Can these be used to create conditional logic quiz? It can be used to create a conditional logic quiz, um, but once again, I think in some instances that needs to be a little bit more of a, how to say it, a little bit more of a hack, I suppose, thinking about um, how are you going to, how are you going to redirect students um, down different paths. And so we find interactive videos using a, a crossroads function is really good for that. And the branching scenario is pretty good for that too. Um, but that seems to be possible. So the, yes, I absolutely can send a link for the HSP website. The, um, there was a request for references from uh, Professor McDaniel's talk, which are now on the website as well. You can find the website over here for the symposium. With that, it's 11 o'clock. We're supposed to start our first um, session, getting to know um, H5P. And so what I think we'll do is that we'll take a 10 minute break and um, we will come back in 10 minutes to start talking about introducing you to H5P um, and uh, start looking at grading our own questions. So Stephen and Brenna and Kaylee, thank you very much for taking time out to come talk to us today, giving us some ideas for what we can use over the next day and a half uh, to create questions for our own courses and context. It's been really fascinating and we appreciate your time. Oh, thanks so much. I hope everybody has a great time. All right. We'll see you in 10 minutes. Thanks, everyone.